uh, over to you ma'am thank you so much and uh, many thanks to banshi bhai and uh, team amdabad for always having me here uh, this is a topic that i love talking about dr sunil gupta myself all of us share a passion for pregnancy and gdm and that is why i think we ended up talking only on this in every conference so the topic assigned to me is busting myths which drugs and why should they be stopped or continued during pregnancy preconception or immediately during lactation so in the next 20 minutes i'll take you through all the different anti diabetes therapies that are available to us and we'll see why and how it is important to be very aware of what medicines your patient is taking especially when she is planning a pregnancy so in simple terms the who and figo have given this umbrella term called hyperglycemia in pregnancy now this encompasses three different entities pre gestational diabetes which means diabetes type 1 type 2 anything that she already has before she is pregnant so she knows i am diabetic and now i am planning a pregnancy diabetes in pregnancy and gdm are two different terms there is a very small thin thread of difference between the two now if a lady is not aware that she has diabetes she gets pregnant she comes to you in early pregnancy you do a pregnancy you do a sugar test and the criteria fulfill that of diabetes in a non pregnant that means fasting is overt more than 126 or 2 hour postprandial is more than 200 so she is meeting the criteria of overt type 2 diabetes she was not aware but she had diabetes and you picked it up right in the beginning early pregnancy now that is what is called diabetes in pregnancy dip however if the lady did not have diabetes in the first trimester also maybe when you've done an hba1c or you've done the glucose levels it was not there but it has gradually developed that is gestational diabetes ideally now we say you know we always thought conventionally it occurs only in second or the third trimester but now we know there's something called egdm early gdm which occurs even at 10 weeks or 11 weeks but the hba1c is still less than 5.7 so she did not have over diabetes maybe she did have beta cell underlying beta cell dysfunction and that is why the glucose levels have started going up now so this is gestational diabetes the difference is dip is going to continue after delivery but gdm most of the cases will go back to normal glycemia few may continue as pre diabetes but most often glucose levels normalize after delivery so that is gestational diabetes now whatever the term is hip management is not only to improve the perinatal outcomes in that particular pregnancy but also to prevent long term maternal and fetal effects and that is why when it comes to choosing the drugs in this entire perinatal period that means from preconception to pregnancy to lactation you have to take a call on the safety of the drugs based on the evidences that we have and i will take you through all these evidences now whenever we are talking of any drug in pregnancy what do you want either it should not cross the placenta so we know it is safe it will not cause harm done or if it crosses the placenta but it does so without causing any fetal harm that means no teratogenic effects no congenital malformations it does not cause fetal hyperinsulinemia and there is no neonatal hypoglycemia so it does not cause harm even if it is causing the placenta so any drug that is passing these tests can be given in pregnancy then there is no problem so now hyperglycemia in pregnancy when we look at the drug management or the pharmacotherapeutic management if it is over diabetes or it is pre gestational diabetes we know if it is type 1 she is already on a basal bolus basal bolus regime all you need to do is intensify the glucose levels based on her smbg and maintain the pregnancy targets so nothing to be uh, you know talked about here insulin we know is very safe it does not cross placenta so we know it is safe none of the insulins crosses placenta so we know they are all safe type 2 diabetes usually the lady will already be on some oral drugs plus minus insulin so if this is a lady who comes to you in the preconception period you need to review the drugs and i'll take you through that in a little while it's always best to transfer her to insulin even preconception 
so that once she becomes pregnant all you need to do is intensify the insulin regime so that the outcomes are good in gdm obviously she did not have diabetes so there is no question of preconception any pharmacotherapy that she may be on of course somebody with pcos or somebody may be on metformin and usually we tend to continue metformin and i'll discuss metformin in a little detail after some time and when it comes to pharmacotherapy in gdm we all know insulin in pregnancy is the gold standard but yes there are certain situations where metformin may be used in select cases select indications and i'll take you through that so now let's revisit all these agents sulfonylureas they are known to cross placenta they have been associated with neonatal hypoglycemia glibenclamide or gliburide has been given in earlier studies nice uk guidelines and figo still talks about using glibenclamide in situations where insulin is not possible or acceptable but you need to understand that gliburide concentration in umbilical cord blood is almost 50 to 70% of the maternal levels it is associated with higher rates of neonatal hypoglycemia and macrosomia in comparison to insulin and metformin long term safety data is lacking and therefore none of the guidelines today recommend using sulfonylureas in pregnancy so the matter is closed here now this is again a very recent meta analysis that compared the birth weights and the outcomes of glibenclamide versus metformin and insulin and you can clearly see it was all against glibenclamide so the matter is settled now alpha glucosidase inhibitors especially acarbose we know only 2% is absorbed as an active drug 34% of metabolites are still found in systemic circulation however high doses have not been found to be teratogenic there's only one rct as of now that is present in evidence which was inadequate so cannot really comment on that there has been a randomized trial of acarbose versus insulin in 91 gdm women there also glucose control and hba1c results were similar however the problem with acarbose is the gi side effects and in pregnancy as it is the woman has gastritis so acarbose does seem to be a promising candidate in gdm however most of the guidelines today because we need more and more evidence before it can be recommended so as of today the stand is it is not yet recommended in pregnancy but this is a study by dr siddharth das's group wherein they've actually looked at the fetal maternal outcomes in patients with gdm who were treated with insulin versus acarbose and what they found was no difference in the incidence of neonatal complications between the two groups and acarbose was found to be quite effective and well tolerated for treatment of gdm in select cases but you need consent if you want to give this for postprandial control because guidelines still do not recommend using acarbose so let's be clear there is data which is coming but till we have a recommendation it is um, you know not really recommended per se to use acarbose yet so you can see the maternal outcomes as well as the neonatal outcomes so clearly maybe in the future when we have more and more data but as of today not recommended in pregnancy glitazones again they cross placenta no studies reported category c drug post implantation losses have been seen in uh, women who were on glitazones especially at doses which were 10 to 40 times of the maximum recommended dose um it is seen to cross placenta fetal tissue levels were seen there is evidence of embryo fetal toxicity if glitazones are continued in pregnancy so clearly you need to stop it pre conception itself no indication for glitazones same applies for gliptins again it does cross placenta it is excreted in breast milk so although risk is low but there are some registries where clearly there have been harmful fetal outcomes uh, five weeks of gestation there was a fetal death there was spontaneous abortion seen in ladies who had continued cetagliptin in pregnancy so there is no safety data and therefore again gliptins are not approved in pregnancy same applies for meglitinides ripaglinide and nateglinide no birth defects or toxicity seen animal data suggests low risk but again they cross placenta and therefore not indicated sglt2 inhibitors relatively newer drugs although they work through a different mechanism but still there are there is no data available as of now on their use in pregnancy pregnancy as it is a, is a dilutional stage so i think not really recommended in pregnancy and we don't have data so not to be used moving on to metformin we know that at cellular level metformin is a positively charged molecule and is transported across the mitochondrial membrane by what is called the octs or the organic cation transporters now placenta expresses many isoforms of octs and therefore metformin also crosses placenta therefore there have been concerns about potential adverse effects on fetal development 
हाउ एवर इट इज नॉट नोन वेदर द ह्यूमन एम्ब्रियो ऑल्सो एक्सप्रेस दीज ओ सिटीज बट प्री इम्प्लांटेशन ह्यूमन एम्ब्रियोज हैव अ वेरी लो कंटेंट ऑफ माइटोकॉन्ड्रिया एंड देर फॉर दे आर अनरिस्पॉन्सिव टू मेटफॉर्मिन इन ऑल द स्टडीज दैट वी हैव टिल नाउ Investigators have not been able to demonstrate any increased embryo activity or congenital malformations with metformin at doses that stimulate maternal levels of AMP kinase. Therefore, metformin essentially now we know is non-teratogenic, although it does cross placenta but does not cause harm. Metformin is also excreted in breast milk. However, the estimated infant dose is less than 0.3 percent of the mother's weight-adjusted dose. so no metformin has been detected in the breastfed infant's plasma so no adverse effects as such on the baby as well if the mother is taking metformin during lactation of course mig study was the landmark study that actually established the safety of metformin in pregnancy but there are studies that have shown that although there is a lower risk of neonatal hypoglycemia and less maternal weight gain in ladies who are taking metformin in pregnancy but there is a slight increased risk of prematurity and small for gestational age babies with metformin so this is the mig study all of us know about it this was women in gdm given metformin and no adverse perinatal complications seen this is again a comparison of metformin versus insulin clearly showing no excess fetal or neonatal complications in the metformin group so definitely metformin seems to be safe weight gain gestational weight gain is much less in the metformin group seems to be better but the problem is more preterm births in a lot of studies in ladies who are given metformin and postnatally children who were exposed to metformin in pregnancy they tend to grow up to be a little more obese and have more of visceral fat so this is again something that needs to be investigated so although it is found to be safe but small for gestational age and preterm is something that has emerged in studies but now we have more studies which are showing that that also does not really occur so i'll take you through that so this is empovar study wherein these were ladies who did not have gdm these were only obese women who were given metformin but benefits of metformin did not really come in terms of preventing gdm and again this is another study where metformin in terms of preeclampsia and gdm development did not really work much in women with pcos also so you can clearly mitti trial was again a landmark trial where women with type 2 diabetes were given metformin in addition to insulin and they were managed and clearly this again showed that you know the mothers on metformin gained at least 200 g less of weight so gestational weight gain was less they were less likely to have lga infants the infants also were not macrosomic or overweight they had reduced adiposity measures in this study but again a small indication of small for gestational age infants did come in the mitti trial now these children were followed up in the mitti kid study two year follow up of the mitti kids again for these children they looked at the adiposity in these children and they found no difference in the mean bmi z scores of these children so clearly metformin did not really show any indication of uh, obesity in these children in the next two year follow up however in male children the trajectory seemed a little different there were small indications of uh, slightly more uh, bmi scores here which was not really significant so it is still being studied however it is reassuring to know that there is no major harm that you see with children exposed to metformin in pregnancy so as of the today most of the guidelines do you know talk of metformin as first line if you look at the figo or the nhs the nice uk guidelines however the who the australian acog idf canadian guidelines ada as and the government of india dipsy guidelines currently recommend using metformin in settings where of course insulin has logistic or compliance issues so some women with gdm who need medical therapy but because of cost barrier language barrier comprehension cultural influences or mild dysglycemia who are not willing for insulin can be offered metformin however where you should not use metformin is very important any pregnancy where there is a potential for growth restriction or acidosis placental insufficiency metformin should not be given to women who have hypertension preeclampsia or are at a risk of iugr so these few so if you are monitoring the the weight of a mother and you see that she is not gaining the weight that she should gain or the child is looking more towards an sga or an iugr and the lady is on metformin you should immediately stop metformin 
so dipsy clearly tells you that if the woman is not willing or cannot take insulin metformin may be recommended you can start with 500 mg twice daily go up to almost the maximum tolerated dose 2 grams per day however if she is still not controlled then of course insulin has to be there so this is all the literature that talks about metformin use in pregnancy these are re very recent nordic register based cohort study again showing no increased congenital malformations in women who were given metformin women with type 2 diabetes given metformin all through pregnancy right from first trimester till the end no congenital malformations no major harm so pretty safe again this is the clue study this is again exposure to metformin wherein they looked at the long term and the short term adverse outcomes in the child and clearly exposure did not result in any increased long term outcomes adverse outcomes in the mother or the child so clearly but again again a very small signal of small for gestational age infants did happen however studies have shown that despite metformin most often the insulin resistance increases in the second and third trimester so much so that insulin needs to be added so clearly uh, this is again another study that looked at the neurocognitive changes in children who were exposed to metformin in pregnancy so no neuro neurocognitive harm no congenital malformations no effect on brain development or cognition seen in children exposed to metformin intrauterine all these studies have clearly shown how metformin reduced pih in some studies reduced nicu admissions reduced lga reduced macrosomia with a slight SGA. So this is the FIGO guidelines, which say that if insulin cannot be given, metformin may be tried. This is our own DIPSI guidelines, and Dr. Sunil Gupta is here, Dr. Chavla is here. We were we're all authors for this guideline, and clearly, standard care talks about using insulin in pregnancy in material of whatever category of uh, dysglycemia it is. Insulin is the drug of choice because it does not cross placenta. However, in a limited care setting. where insulin is not possible not feasible or there is just a mild degree of dysglycemia there are no other major complications metformin may be given so and uh, you know most of our obstetrician colleagues will agree that they continue metformin and they've never seen any problem with metformin so maybe uh, you know it is safe to continue metformin in pregnancy in uh, this category of women i told you the contraindications where it has to be stopped risk of prematurity small for gestational age is the only reason where you should stop this is the mompod study again looking at insulin versus metformin in pre existing type 2 diabetes and the study was actually stopped early on because of all the benefits that we saw maternal hypoglycemia was less neonatal fatal uh, fatal um, fat mass was much less in the metformin group so clearly metformin did not really cause any adverse neonatal outcomes and rather resulted in fewer lga infants so this is the ace document on a follow up this is dr yajnik's group that published this uh, very recently in endocrine practice long term impact on offsprings the 5 to 11 year old uh follow up you know of children when they are 5 years to 11 years old these were children exposed to metformin again clearly it showed that children at the age of 9 years born to mothers who were treated with metformin in pregnancy had similar bmi similar waist circumference to height ratio dexa total fat percent adipose visceral adipose tissue volume was no different in the insulin group versus the metformin group so metformin use in pregnancy did not show any adverse effects compared with insulin when it comes to the 9 year to 11 year follow up of children who were given exposed to metformin in pregnancy so again clearly says that it seems to be safe so to sum up you need to continue of course insulin in women with type 1 diabetes who have established good control you need to intensify when it comes to women with type 2 you need to stop all oral drugs continuing metformin or not depends on the patient there and the situation there so it has to be a calculated decision between you and the obstetrician with the consent of the patient she needs to be informed because metformin does cross placenta however it is best to take her on to insulin right from preconception and continue till lactation avoid uh, stop ace inhibitors arvs diuretics stop statins anything that can cause harm even substance abuse smoking is very common in ladies these days alcohol consumption cannabis recreation drugs you need to counsel don't take it for granted you need to tell them to stop all this preconception itself and of course folic acid to prevent neural tube defects is very important adding aspirin is very important to prevent preeclampsia insulin i told you does not cross placenta safe effective all insulins are found to be safe lactation again i told you it is energy 
intensive process so small frequent meals are important you may reduce the basal dose because it can cause nocturnal hypoglycemia if the mother is not eating metformin is excreted in breast milk i showed you but then it does not really cause major fetal harm or any harm to the baby so maybe uh, maybe uh, continued so to conclude hyperglycemia in pregnancy is associated with an increased risk of maternal and fetal complications guidelines recommend an optimum glycemic control to prevent the risk of maternal fetal complications and improve outcomes insulin remains the gold standard for management of uh, hyperglycemia in pregnancy in patients who need pharmacotherapy metformin has been largely found safe for use in pregnancy except for those contraindications where i told you and small concerns of small for gestational age and prematurity or a tendency towards a slight rise in bmi that is seen in a few studies how so therefore metformin may be used with caution in specific situations where insulin is not acceptable or possible long term data is still needed no other drug as of today is considered safe in pregnancy and should not be continued that is my message from here it has to be insulin or plus minus metformin thank you so much